Pleasant, pleasant July 26th. I say happy, happy Independence Day from all of us here at Focus on Liberia. This is the Liberia History Channel on Focus on Liberia. My name is Dennis Ja, and we are broadcasting from Atlanta, Georgia. Today is July 26, 2023, and we are celebrating Liberia's 176th Independence Day. And so this show is all about the Declaration of Independence. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Let me first welcome our presenter, Carl Famule. Carl, happy, happy 26. Happy Sovereignty Day, Dennis. Carl, happy Sovereignty Day. It's <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for, for coming. Let me also welcome Basa Barry. That's uh, our friend and brother, Jibari. That's uh, Darius Lem. Darius, happy, happy Independence Day. Happy Independence to you. Happy 176th birthday to Liberia. Thank you. <laughs> Let me also welcome for the second time on the Library History Channel, our friend joining us all the way from Australia. And you may, Julate Cassell. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Dennis. Happy Independence Day. Happy, wonderful. 176 years to Liberia. Thank you and happy Independence Day as well. We want to say happy Independence Day to all our viewers across the globe. We are commemorating Liberia's 176th 
Independence Day, we want to say welcome, share the show. What we're going to do tonight is to discuss independence. It's independent. So it's going to be a very relaxed, free-flowing conversation. We want all of you watching us to be your part as we discuss the Declaration of Independence. If you have not been able to read one, we have it here for you. I also have it in a book called Foundational Worlds of Our Nation. So you can check that out. It's on Amazon. So the oh, wow. Declaration of Independence. What we'll be doing tonight is uh, we want to sit with that. We want to put it in context. What really does it mean? Why did we have to declare independence? Independence from whom? Somebody will always ask. And if we may ask, what does it mean to you? When they say Labra is independent today. And you may, let me start with you. Happy Independence Day. What's how you feel today about Labra being 176 years old? I feel great. I feel I feel privileged. I feel honored to call myself a Liberian. And um, I feel I feel I feel great. I, um to be a part of this wonderful country, to be a part of this, you know, this this black land. That uh, it's mine that I'm part of, and my sisters are part of. Thank you. It's and, and great. You, great. And if you notice, uh, we are just rocking the national colors, red, white, and blue. Let me welcome <laughs> Pastor Barry, who is also in his red, white, and blue, but with a little twist. That's uh, the Leadership Academy t shirt that has the national colors as well. Pastor Barry, what's, how you feel, man? I feel great. I have been in high spirits today. I've been taking it all in, just appreciating what Liberia has done, what its accomplishments, its achievement, and just telling it to everybody just the importance and significance of July 26, 1847. That is one of the greatest days in world history. It influenced the continent of Africa. It influenced African-Americans, Afro-Caribbeans, and the diaspora. We underestimate just how significant July 26, 1848 Today, we're going to just how great it was. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Carl, it's July 26. Yes. Uh, it's important, of course, and for all the reasons my, my, my fellow panelists stated, it is also um, a moment that we declared war on essentially on white supremacy. We essentially drew a line in the sand uh, and stood up as a testament that this lie, this false doctrine that belittled and humanized us was not going to go forward into the future. Liberia really exists as an affront, as a antithesis to the ideology of white supremacy. And it's really important that we understand this. What was happening in the context of the world in 1847, what the prevailing doctrine that was being propagated not only among people of European descent, but all people in the world were being pumped and sold on an idea, a, a false, pseudo-scientific race theory of which African people were at the bottom of the human totem, totem pole and Western Europeans at the top. So we were not supposed to be sovereign. We were not supposed to have a republic. We're not supposed to self-govern. Standing up and declaring yourself independent in the year 1847 was akin to waging war on an ideology and the entire history of Liberia, almost parallel with the history of Haiti, has been the world powers trying to crush this reminder that their doctrine is false. Hmm. That's, they, that's profound, go ahead. Yeah, so this this uh, show, we're going to talk about this declaration and what a, an incredible ripple effect this had globally. Um, the effect it also had on people on the continent of Africa who were already sovereign. Because remember that this is before the Berlin Conference. So Africa as a whole, the continent, 
with very few exceptions, was self-governed. So self-governed mostly in chiefdoms, kingdoms, empires, and in uh, uh, different types of government systems, not necessarily Western style republic or de de uh, democracy style systems, but definitely there were countries and nations and people had citizenships and belonging to various nations. Uh, some of them were based on their ethnicities. Some of them were based on, you know, a empire that had conquered them that was diverse with many different language families. Um, but for the most part in 1847, much, almost all of Africa was, was pretty much uh, under the control of African people. So we're gonna talk about the distinction here. And it's very, very important um, that we, we do recognize that Liberia is not the first country in Africa. It was not the first country in the region and that it really only encompassed the land that was acquired by the Commonwealth at the time that the Declaration of Independence was written by Hillary Teague. That context is very important um, because things change later, which caused people who belong to other countries, other nations, other political organizations, very ancient ones, to then give up that old system of government and join the Republic later to avoid colonial rule. We always confuse this when we talk about Liberian history because the concept that many people have is that there was some kind of statelessness that the Republic was built on top of. And this is not true. It's very important to recognize that the land that was occupied is a very small fraction of what Liberia is today. My specific ancestors, for the most part, belonged to a nation that was controlled by leaders in a very old and ancient political system. And that nation had other alliances with other nations through the traditional Poro and Sende alliances. Now, it's important to recognize this because the misconception is that Liberia was established with the boundaries that it has today. We'll get into that further as we continue, but it's, it, it, the context of, of what occurred in 1847 is important for me, though in 1847, my ancestors were part of a different nation because Liberia existed, they had a means to defend their sovereignty and choose whether they were going to be conquered by European powers 40 years after Liberia was established, or if they were going to stand in solidarity with Liberia and become Liberian. This part of the story is always omitted. So most of the citizens of Liberia today do not understand how they became Liberian. Though it's clearly documented, for some reason, it is not taught in schools. So our general consciousness and understanding of how Liberia came to exist is based on misinformation or really disinformation because I believe a lot of that information is kept from Liberians intentionally. But we will talk about those details, but I just wanted to set the stage and let everyone know that while this can encompass just a very small portion of what is Liberia today, because these men, and they were men, this is 1847, there were not women involved in the process at the Constitutional Committee, at least not openly, maybe in the bedroom, they would tell their husband, you know, what they needed to go and say, but not at the table, because that was the reality of the world at the time. But these men, what the decision that they made, this decision that they made to stand up that Sierra Leone did not make is what protected 
the land rights of the people who exist in the Republic today. Protections that the British did not afford to people in Sierra Leone, protections that the French did not afford to people in Guinea or the Ivory Coast. Thank you. Uh, this, uh, the rest of the week, we are devoting it to our independence. Today is a uh, Labyrinth History Channel, and we are doing the Declaration of Independence. Tomorrow, on Top Talking Thursday, we're going to do the State of the Nation at 176. What we're going to be talking about will be what does independence mean to you? And what is the state of the nation? And then we look into the future. Then on Friday on the Literary Hour, One Mile to Independence, the Thomas Hawking story that will be on the History Hour. And guess what? On Sunday, we're going to have our Independence Day celebration. That's FOL Virtual Independence Day celebration. The theme for this year is sovereignty, independence, and responsible citizenship. FOL has selected Carl Famule as this year's national orator. Tune in on Sunday at 4 p.m. for our virtual Independence Day program. If you have never been proud of being a Liberian, start today. Well, we're going to get started into our presentation for the day. And uh, let me start the presentation and get you guys start going while I watch. Call back to you. Yes, sir. So basically, this is just um, uh, a copy of 1847 publication of Liberia's Declaration of Independence, uh, which is kept at the New York Public Library. That is a snapshot of it. Um, one of the very interesting things about this cover document is that it basically reflects um, who was being addressed in, in, in the Declaration of Independence. The document also includes the Constitution, the 1847 Constitution, and then um, it goes on to have other notes by Hillary Teague. Uh, what I extracted from this is the actual wording of the Declaration of Independence. Independent Republic. And it was, it was powerful. It went all over the world, this publication. I mean, this is a time when there was no, there were, there were no telegrams. Uh, there, there, there was no internet, right? There were no telephones. There was this technology left by ship. So the moment this happened, you've got, you know, British ships off the shore and American ships and they're giving, you know, correspondence to take across the Atlantic. Their concern was to deliver this to the free people of color living in the United States of America and to tell them, hey, we're sovereign. We have a home. We have a country. Finally, we're self-governing. And it was powerful. So, Carl, let me just uh, give a, a background here. Mm -hmm. because when we say Declaration of Independence, so in in a couple of years ago, my organization published a book called The Republic of Liberia Foundational Worlds of Our Nation. And this book is on Amazon, include the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the uh, Lone Star Forever, the National Anthem, and so forth, those documents, right? And while writing, compiling those uh, documents, I did a survey among Liberians. I mean, we say it's not scientific. And about 80% of those I surveyed have not read the Declaration of Independence. Right. They knew it existed, but they have never read it. About 80% of Liberians. So what we're going to be doing today may be very known to some people who still haven't read the Declaration of Independence. I just want to mention that. That's, that is, so that that's pretty shocking. Um, I've lived I've lived in in a few countries. I lived in a few countries, and Antigua, the United States. I've lived in Liberia, and 
and I've visited many places, but I don't think that there's any other country in the world that doesn't teach their either their Declaration of Independence or their basic history of their founding, if they were never colonized um, or never needed to declare independence from a, a, a corporation. Um, I don't think that there's any country that doesn't teach this um, in their basic, you know, at least K through 12 education. Right. So I find that very peculiar. And we should, as Liberians, um, recognize the great disservice that was done to us um, by the people we partnered with to help develop our education system right. and, 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 and decentralize it. Maybe, maybe you see my, my witness behind the house. Ayumi, what's your experience with uh, the Declaration of Independence and maybe people that you know? Are you, are you sure? A lot of people I know have not read it. And I was an adult when I found it out, when I got interested in what the liberal constitution was. That was, that was way back when I was in, when I was in Bangkok. That's when I started reading. I used to love reading, first of all. But then to start to really get into librarian history, things that happened, I was back in Bangkok when I started. And that's when I Google on, on the net to find what our constitution really said. Because when I came from Liberia, I did a trip in Liberia. And at that time, that's when World War III started. And that got me, I got so down about it. And it just woke something up. I just got angry. And I wanted to find out things. So that's when I found it. I was an adult. I already had my children. That's how bad it is. <laughs> so, so I mean, just to just to be clear, because it happened to me, so I want to know how, what was the situation with other people. Did you know that the Declaration of Independence existed, and you had no interest, or nobody told you, or um, you just didn't really know? I know, I know it was it, it existed because we declared ourselves a nation, so definitely there should be a declaration. No. But it, it just wasn't one of the things we talk about. Right, you didn't give me we've, a we've we've been we've been sub uh, uh, subjected to 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 discuss irrelevant things. You know, who running where and why the person doing this. I mean, it thinks that has no benefit at all. That's we have made it a culture to discuss those things. So who's thinking about constitution? Like really, that's mm. a step you wake up that fire in you on your own. You know, so yeah. Anyway, uh, Jabari, does that surprise you? Um, the the results doesn't don't really surprise me because when we look at Liberian history, oftentimes it's very dehumanized. It's very abstract. It's seen as something that's not significant. So people not reading the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, or even the Constitutional Convention, what led up to the Declaration of Independence. Is, is is not surprising considering how even when it comes to the people who signed it, most, I would assume most people look at them as just men who signed the paper. They don't know who these men actually were in the way that in the United States where I'm from, we know who John Adams was. We know who Thomas Jefferson was. We know who John Hancock is in their background. That is not really taught when it comes to the Liberian Declaration of Independence. Thank you. Uh, let me put a few comments on the screen just to bring home, drive home this point. Elvis Morris, one of our informed listeners, say it is embarrassing, but I haven't read it either. Uh, G Star say I have came over the 1847 Constitution, but it wasn't an in depth read. Uh, Jomo say I'll be ordering the book. I need to read it. Sadly, I have not read it either. So, to my uh, panelists and presenter, you have your work cut out. I, if if I may, it was one of the reasons why when I wrote an article today, I wrote an article about the the backstory of the Declaration of Independence. I really wanted to and and it really broke down um, the background behind the Declaration of Independence, who these men were, where they were from what careers they had before the Declaration of Independence, and also what does the Declaration of Independence mean? What does the document mean? How is it, how can it be interpreted? What was the significance? What was the background behind it? I felt I need to do this because that shows just how significant 
the Independence Day was, for people to understand who these men were, the background behind it, and what does it mean. I didn't really understand the Liberian Declaration of Independence or even the Constitution until I read it. Once I read the Declaration of Independence and I read the Constitution, a lot of the myths and misconceptions are debunked right in those two documents. You read exactly. those two documents and it's clear cut what Liberia was meant for, its relationship to the Africans on the ground, the sovereign Africans and Africans abroad. And let me also say that the first time I read it, I was angry. And so we're going to go into that today and explain to the world what really this means and put that in context. Maybe that will help for right. some who are angry, who were angry like me that time. Maybe it will help you understand it. Well, yeah, we, we, yeah, and I, I think one of the things that I, I said, the reason I did the introduction the way I did is because you hear intelligent people, educated people say things like, we were not included, we were denied, we were excluded, we were denied citizenship. And it is the most outrageous thing because before you can think that way, you have to believe that you had no citizenship, that you didn't belong to anything. Before you can say that, you have to think that your forefathers were not fully human. They had no governments. And I said, started asking myself, why do people think this? You have a slither of land on the coast where people declare independence and you're from Nimba or in the interior part of Sino or somewhere that wasn't really affected. And then the question becomes, why do you think that your ancestors would have wanted to be forcibly incorporated? Only if you think that they didn't already have governments would you conclude that way. And then the question is, who taught you that? Who taught you to believe that there were no governments existing until ACS arrived on the coast? Because that is what that assumption means. That anger comes from a, con a concept of a presupposed concept of some form of inferiority, really. Because we do not know indigenous Liberian history, and we do not know enough about what indigenous Liberians were doing. And because indigenous history is intentionally excluded from the Liberian curriculum in depth, people don't understand what happens. They therefore don't believe they have a history. And that is unfortunate. And this is one of the reasons I continuously do this history channel, volunteer to do it because I know if I didn't know these things and I didn't have access to this information, I would want someone to share it with me. Human beings get their self esteem, their identity from their history. I think their anger is misplaced but there is a need for outrage. Every Liberian should be outraged. The full story should, should have been told. Every child should be learning it in the school system. That is, that's, that's, that's the key, right? If, if, you don't, if you don't learn it. So, this is the first part of the Declaration of Independence. We, the people of the Republic of Liberia, were originally the inhabitants of the United States of North America. In some parts of that country, we were debarred by law from all the rights and privileges of men. In other parts, public sentiment more powerful than law frowned us down. We were everywhere shut out from all civil office, we were excluded from all participation in the government. We were taxed 
taxed without our consent, we were compelled to contribute to the resources of a country which gives us no protection. Wow. This I think that's pretty much self-explanatory. Um, Hillary Teague uh, was a brilliant orator and writer um, who, who penned this. He was uh, first settled at Sherbrooke. He was one of the um, first people to go to uh, Cape Mesorado um, in 1822. He transferred to Cape Mesorado on the, on the alligator. Um, one of the lines that causes a lot of confusion for people who are either um, not that proficient in English or who speak multiple languages is the very first line. I've learned that whenever teaching or, or sharing the, um, the Declaration of Independence with people, they think that this first line says that they were the original inhabitants as opposed to it saying they don't understand that it actually means, they, they, it basically means we originally lived in America. Doesn't mean that they're the original inhabitants of America. They're communicating like in Liberia where we, we um, Liberia were the, uh, I'm sorry, originally the inhabitants of the United States of North America. It means we used to live there. That's where we were born. We originally lived there, we originated from there. That's the translation, as opposed to what many people misinterpreted to mean that they were original inhabitants as if they were aboriginals of America. That's not what that means. I just wanted to clarify that. Well, and it's good to say that for a lot of us who didn't read it at that time and heard it, this is how it was told to us. It was told to me, at least. It says, we, the people of Liberia, of Liberia originating from the United States. Oh, that's how that's how I heard it before I ever had the opportunity to read it. Yeah, it's saying we ori we originally the inhabitants. Inhabitants meaning you originally lived somewhere. I originally inhabited Minneapolis, you know, and now I live in Georgia. Originally inhabited. It it, it right. is not and and for most of them in fact, I believe for all of the signers, that was their place of birth. Right. So, so, so Carl, I, I mean, the reason here is, uh, and, and we started with that, right? That uh, people, mm -hmm. if something is told to you, because the way I heard it was, we the people of Liberia originating from the United States. That's how I heard it. So if you don't see, if you don't read something yourself and whatever, reason it was told to mean that way that's what i believe and that's what most people believe that it said even though we didn't see yeah it. And, and and you're going to see a lot of things even with the constitution that that kind of thing happens because and i don't know if it's deliberate propaganda because they know other people don't have access to the documents or if it's just not really understanding how to comprehend language when they read i don't know but it's very clear to me, like when I found out people had confusion, I, I couldn't understand why. And then I had to remember, if you speak multiple languages, it's very difficult to always grasp everything. You know, so I think that's, you know, but to me, it's clear that they're saying they originally lived there, which is true. Uh Hey, you may want to say something. It's, this is for me. This is very. It is a very touchy subject for me. It's um, it's very emotional for me when it comes to this declaration and um, because it, there's it's just and it's like our daily life. We don't we don't back check things like whatever someone tells us. Once we respect that person, we have kind of made it that a culture. Once we respect that person, oh, we don't even check what the person say. And when people want to divide people, they get to study them and find out how they react to things. And they use your weaknesses against you. And that's what I'm looking at here. You know, 
uh, it's, it's, it's just easy when you know that uh, they will read it or they don't have the, the access to it. They don't even have the interest in it. Yeah. So that make it really look bad so that interest can really go away. So that's just what it's I'm not about. Yeah, it's not about us. This document got nothing to do with us. Why would we read it kind of thing? Yeah, well, I, well I mean, you know, the country already like that. Oh, the, you know, we are, they already created that thing. So it's just easy for it to work up to our generation. We're talking about 176 years. These things have been going on. You know, so it, it's, it's touchy for me. You can go ahead. Thank you, Amy. That was let's, let's, it's a long document, so let's try to get through it, Dennis. All right, long, long one. Uh, the second part say we were made a separate and distinct class. And against us, every avenue to improvement was effectually closed. Strangers from all lands of a color different from ours were preferred before us. We authored our complaints, but they were unattended to, or only met by alleging the peculiar institutions of the country. All hope of a favorable change in our country was thus wholly extinguished in our bosoms, and we looked with anxiety abroad for some asylum from the deep degradation. Tell us that, right? Yep. You can keep going, Dennis. The western coast of Africa was the place selected by American benevolence and philanthropy for our future home, removed beyond those influences which de depressed us in our native land it was hoped we would be able to enjoy those rights and privileges and exercise and improve those faculties which the God of nature has given us in common with the rest of mankind. So I want you to pause there for a second, Dennis. All right. This is the year 1847. The world has accepted an ideology that African people are at the bottom of the human total pool and that they should be chattel, they should be property. In 1847, the majority of African people in the Western Hemisphere were property in the Caribbean, in South America, and in the United States, with very few exceptions, Haiti being one of them. In 1847, this was revolutionary, futuristic, outrageous thinking for Hillary Teague to say to them, which the God of nature has given us in common with the rest of mankind. To assert your sovereignty is to assert your humanity, your human beingness. When these people arrived, their journey across the Atlantic, they passed ships carrying slaves in their halls. When they arrived on the coast, they saw slave barracoons all up and down the coast. They saw European and American vessels buying human beings. And they said, God, the God of nature has given us the same faculty as the rest of mankind, basically. For me, this was an assertion. This is an affront to the entire global system, the entire global economy, which is based on human chattel slavery and the exploitation of African people. And here is a descendant of Africa standing on African soil making this proclamation. It was powerful. Very, very yes, powerful. Was. We, we continue. Under the auspices of the American Colonization Society, we established ourselves here on land acquired by purchase from the laws of the soil. 
in an original compact with this society, we, for important reasons, delegated to it certain political powers. Why this institution stipulated that whenever the people should become capable of conducting the government, or whenever the people should desire it, this institution will resign the delegated power, peaceably withdraw its supervision, and leave the people to government of them to the government of themselves. Under the auspices and guidance of this institution, which has nobly and in perfect faith redeemed its pledges to the people, we have grown and prospered. We continue. From time to time, our number has been increased by migration from America and by accessions from native tribes. And from time to time, has circumstances required we have extended our borders by acquisition of land by honorable purchase from the natives of the country. As our territory has extended and our population increased, our commerce has also increased. The flags of most of the civilized nations of the earth float in our harbors and their merchants are opening an honorable and profitable trade. Until recently, these visits. Okay, hold on, hold on, Dennis. I'm sorry. One second. Okay. Um, two things I wanted us to point out here. Um, the accession, our numbers have increased. Do you see that part? Yeah. Let's go back to that. From yeah, from time to time, as circumstances required it, we have extended our borders by acquisition of land, by honorable purchase from natives of this country. Before that, it says from time to time, our number has been increased by migration from America and by accessions from native tribes. So we gloss over this. Mind you, we're talking about a very small portion of coastal territory that is being occupied at this time. And there were people in that coastal territory. Those people were part of the Commonwealth and those people were among the first citizens. A large number of the people who were part of the first citizens were people who were liberated as places, Barracoon, slave factories like Trade Town in these places were conquered. You also have people like the Day who sought refuge from Gatamba during that war in the late 1820s and sought refuge among the colonists. So this is a group of people who are all seeking liberty. They've come together. Some of the people who were the abused and exploited indigenous people, victims of war and tyranny from stronger kings also came. The number of day that were massacred and sold into slavery was almost an attempted genocide by the Gola. <coughs> Many of their surviving remnants sought refuge among the colonists. Many Basa, many scattered people who were conquered from Northern territories and being brought to the coast to be sold that were subsequently liberated were then treated and incorporated the same way recaptured Africans were. So this is not a monolithic culture, a monolithic society. There was already, from the inception, there was already diversity. Well, a session, and, and let me, so there were walls and there were slave, or slave camps and stations. So has those states or slave stations get liberated? I mean, yes. what are you gonna do? You were taken from somewhere, you were a slave somewhere. So when you are liberated, you, you go to, uh, 
Kim Maserato or Providence Island. You get you, you or Trey Town or, or yeah or or, or Robertsport. At this point, uh, Galenus was still was was part of the coastal acquisition. So all of those old slave factories, if you go and look at the Voyages uh, slave database, all those points where the slave trade, I mean the the slave traders had their contacts at the bases of those rivers, the St. Paul, the St. John, the Galenus or the Mont Bacino or the Mono River as we call it now, the Kavala, the 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 mouth of all of these rivers, the Sestos, if you if you look at that, if you look at Cape Mount, at Robertsport where Lake Piso is, which is an estuary, if you go there and you look at the slave trade map where they, they were picking up human beings from during the slave trade, it completely overlaps where all the, what we call settler towns were. So they built their towns on top of old slave factories as they, just as uh, 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 Governor Buchanan and, and later on Governor Roberts waged war on all these slave factories. So this is not, I mean, he says your honorable purchase, um, meaning that there was an agreement, meaning that there was an agreement to purchase this land. So they say honorable purchase because these were treaties, but I do want to point out, it's unlike the treaty at Cape Maserata or the treaty for, 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 for um, uh, Providence Island or Perseverance Island as it was once called. These treaties came after stomping out slave trades. Mm -hmm. So there was violent dis dissolution of these slave factories. And the people who were being held captive in these barracoons were liberated and incorporated into Liberia. And many of these people and were from the northern parts or also from the coastal parts. If you read some of the manifest, they had names like Koto, they had names like Bwaka, they had names like Sa, they had names like Toga. Many of them were children. And so these were among the early citizens. But it's very important to point out, Robertsport, Monrovia, Marshall, uh, Buchanan, Traytown, Edina, Greenville, si I mean, uh, uh, Harper, these places are all built on top of old slave barracoons. And we have demonstrated that in previous episodes of the History Channel. Right. Very, very fascinating stuff. I, I know, you know, uh, our audience and people always go to that. So it's important that you mention that, that <laughs> prior to the coming of the uh, the one we call settlers, there were slave camps in what, what we call Liberia today. There were slave camps. And so they, those settlements were built, some of them, after those camps were defeated. And the slaves, and at the end of that fight, they will sign a treaty, right? Yes. And those slaves will join the colony. That's correct. And they will, they, you know, so I just wanted to point out this honorable purchase. I don't want people to believe that it was a kumbaya, we come in, and then, you know, some slave dealer, like uh, uh, Bage, just got up and said, you know what? I'm not going to, you know, practice my business that makes me powerful anymore. You know, let me just join you. No. They had to fight to free those people and to stop and stomp out the slave trade. Mm -hmm. And, and Joseph Jenkins Roberts, as deputy governor, as governor, of the Commonwealth, our first president, in his own words, did more to end the slave trade than any native of Europe. And that's a quote. So he's saying, I, Joseph Jenkins Roberts, I've done more to stomp out the slave trade than all of the natives of Europe, I think is what it said, not any, but all of the natives of Europe. That's powerful. powerful. That's Liberia. We don't talk about this. 
It should make us proud. It's also important that when they bring up honorable purchase and talk about the ascensions of the native tribes, that that is very important because oftentimes you hear the narrative uh, of comparing as usual, Liberia with America, oh, like the American Declaration of Independence, or like, or in the cases even of South Africa. And, and people really don't understand, how, one, how dangerous it is, but number two, what they're even referring to. What, I've read the Declaration of Independence of the United States. Native Americans are not even recognized at all. Well. At all. Not in South Africa, they weren't even in, in the 90s. They didn't even consider black South Africans to be human beings in the mm -hmm. 90s when so we went you, to South Africa. So you have here, they're recognizing that the people who live there, the indigenous population, they are a part of us. They are a part of this country. They helped establish this country. They're, it's recognizing them. In some Our numbers have increased refer back to the text it says our numbers have increased it doesn't say we brought native subjects here it says our numbers have increased by the accessions from native tribes that alone is the reason they didn't don't want people reading this document because they want you to believe that there was apartheid and that your people you know my people everybody was just running around you know doing booga booga and beating drums. They hang it from trees. This is the narrative of white supremacy, is to belittle Africans and justify what was done to them at that time in history. This is powerful. Uh, let's, let's continue. Uh, let, me, let me welcome uh, Mr. Percy mm -hmm. Harris. Percy is joining us from the state of Delaware. Percy, welcome to the Library History Channel. Um, thank you, Dennis. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Thank you. I, I've been following the show while I was driving. Um, I, I don't know where I can come here. I think the panelists have done a good job here. And um, I'm liking the break the breakdown that's going on. It's, it's important. And <laughs> most of most of the miseducation I've having now that I'm listening to you guys, most of the miseducation I've having, like Brad, I, I, I'm probably attributing it, attributing it probably to the lack of reading. So, because these are these are crystal clear language that are being read here, and I mean, I'm not saying English is my first language or whatever, but I mean, these people wrote clear English, right? And we we have inverted it in Liberia and, and, and perverted it in a way that and make it seem like, I mean, I, I mean I'm, in, I'm in a group of, of a very good friend of mine. <laughs> he, he said, everybody that, that found the country were criminals, they were rogues. He concerned the criminals, they've been, people have been stealing from the beginning of the country. These are the kind of misconception that in a society like, like, like ours, you throw that out there and, and people just run with it. And, and and I was listening to you guys. Let me don't take the full time. I was listening to you guys talking about your first encounter with um, the Declaration of Independence. For me, I started to question myself at a very early age when I was small in elementary school. I can still remember. I'm like, what is this country all about? You know, when you talk to older people, they tell you, they tell you, oh, they fought the war. Oh, nineteen eighty, my mom tell me about nineteen eighty five. The children were running from L. U. Campbell. I'm like, but what happened? What, what happened? Why all this strife? Why everything come about? And that's how I started to educate myself. I started to sit down with more older people and start to understand what happened. And then there was Joseph Seguin. God bless his soul, right? Because if you went to school in like brother he book, you went through. And in as much as now, now in in retrospect, looking at Guanum books. You know, it was not. It was not all the information were not there. But he touched on certain issues. It made you curious, right? He didn't go yeah. in depth, but it made you curious. Like, okay, what happened here? Why the story did not end? Like, what what happened? You know. So then you start doing back on your own research, and I have somebody like me came around and started to like 
read more and more about the country and try to understand um, the oral and written history about, about, about this country because I wanted to know what kind of country I'm a part of, right? What is this country about? Are these people all criminals, right? Like they say, right? And I, I think sometimes that criminal narrative is put out there to justify criminality today. It's just, you know, we'll say this so that we don't look like we degenerated, which is exactly what has happened. You know, we'll just say things. I mean, even if they believe that the founders of the country were criminals, what about all of the other nations that existed in Liberia? So all of the, the poor nations that were all criminals too. I mean, what are they saying? That they didn't have a country, that they didn't have humanity before. It just, it's because of this. And I don't think it's because of reading alone. I think it's deliberate the way the curriculum is set up. Thank you. Let, let, me, let me continue. And um, we'll have more to chew on. Until recently, these visits have been of a uniformly harmonious character, but has, they have become more frequent and to more numerous points of our extending coast, questions have arisen. I, I think I need to go back because so that people connect. Yes. From time to time, this is where we were, from time to time, our number has been increased by migration from America and by accessions from native tribes. And from time to time, as circumstances required it, we have extended our borders by acquisition of land by honorable purchase from the natives of the country. As our territory has extended and our population increased, our commerce has also increased the flags of most of the civilized nations of the earth float in our harbors, and their merchants are opening an honorable and profitable trade. Until recently, these visits have been of a uniformly harmonious character, but as they have become more frequent and to more numerous points of our extending coast, questions have arisen which it is supposed can be adjusted only by agreement between sovereign powers. For years past, the American Colonization Society has virtually withdrawn from all direct and active part in the administration of the government, except in the appointment of the governor, who is also a colonist, for the apparent purpose of testing the ability of the people to conduct the affairs of government, and no complaint of crude legislation, none of mismanagement, nor of mild administration has yet been heard. In view of these facts, this institution, the American Colonization Society, with that good faith which has uniformly marked all its dealing with us by a set of resolutions in January in the year of our law 1846, dissolve all political connection with the people of this republic returned the power with which it was delegated and left the people to the government of themselves. The people of the Republic of Liberia then are of right and in fact a free, sovereign and independent state, possessed of all the rights, powers and functions of government. Wow. In assuming the momentous responsibilities of the position they have taken, the people of this republic feel justified by the necessities of the case. And with this conviction, they throw themselves with confidence upon the candid consideration of the civilized world. Liberia is not the offspring <laughs> of grasping ambition, nor the tool of avaricious speculations. No desire for territorial aggrandizement brought us to these shores nor do we believe so sordid a motive enter into the high consideration of those who aided us in providing this asylum. Liberia is an asylum from the most grinding oppression. In coming to, these, to the shores of Africa, we indulged the pleasing hope that we will be permitted to exercise and improve those faculties which impart to man is his dignity to nourish in our hearts the flame of honorable ambition, 
to cherish and indulge those aspirations which a, benefic a beneficent creator had implanted in every human heart and to invince to all who despise, ridicule, and oppress our race that we possess with them a common nature, are with them susceptible of equal refinement and capable of equal advancement in all that adorns and dignifies men. Amen. We were animated with the hope that here we should be at liberty to train up our children in the way they should go, to inspire them with the love of an honorable fame, to kindle within them the flame of a lofty philanthropy, to form strong within them the principles of humanity, virtue, and religion. Among the strongest motives to leave our native land, to abandon forever the sins of our childhood, to sever the most endeared connections, was the desire for a retreat where, free from the agitations of fear and molestation, we could, in composure and security, approach and worship the God of our fathers. Thus, for our highest hope have been realized. Liberia is already the happy home of thousands who were once the doomed victims of oppression. And if left unmolested to go on with her natural and spontaneous growth, if her movements be left free from paralyzing intrigues of jealous, ambitious, and unscrupulous avarice, she will throw open a wider and yet a wider door for thousands who are now looking with an anxious eye for some land of rest. Our courts of justice are open equally to the stranger and the citizen for the redress of grievances, for the remedy of injuries, and for the punishment of crime. Our numerous and well-attended schools attest our efforts and our desire for improvement of our children. Our churches for worship of our creator everywhere to be seen bear testimony to our piety and to our acknowledgement of his providence. The native African bowing down with us before the altar in the name of the great God, our common creator, our common judge. We appeal to the nations of Christendom and earnestly and respectfully ask of them that they will regard us with the sympathy and friendly consideration to which the peculiarities of our condition entitle to us and to the extent to us, that comedy which marks the friendly intercourse of civilized and independent communities. Done in convention at Monrovia in the county of Montserrado by the unanimous consent of the people of the Commonwealth of Liberia, this 26th day of July in the year of our law, 1847. 1, That's 1847. And then can you show that, well, Jabari's gonna go over the signers, but there's a lot to unpack there. Um, a lot. The, the, very, the very first thing I'd like to say before my colleagues come in is that there's a lot of confusion in the Liberian curriculum. Children are being taught that the Commonwealth of Liberia and the Republic of Liberia are one and the same. Children are being taught that the flag of the Commonwealth was Liberia's first flag. This is false. This document abolished the Commonwealth. This document created the Republic of Liberia. This document marks the moment of sovereignty for Liberia. The Commonwealth ceased to exist on this day. The curriculum is wrong, and that's a problem. And the problem and confusion that it's causing is that people believe that the Republic of Liberia is 200 years old. People believe that ACS created the Republic of Liberia. Can you please put up the signatures on this document?
These are the founders of the Republic of Liberia. In any country, a committee that comes together and creates a constitution, the credit for that country goes to these men. The credit for the country goes to the men who are listed here. These men, these sons of Africa, who were born abroad and had the courage to return to the land of their fathers in their own words and establish Africa's first republic. Not Africa's first nation, not Africa's first country, Africa's first republic. Africa's first democracy in the modern sense of the word democracy. And this needs to be the takeaway. Everything else we say after this is just going to be buttressing this. I want everyone that listens to this to understand how incredibly inaccurate and disrespectful it is to our country when our leaders, our politicians stand up on July 26th and thank the United States of America for creating Liberia when they did not even recognize this document until 1868. Right. This was a peaceful transaction, but it was not amicable and it was not welcome. The last thing I'll say, and then I'll turn it over to my colleagues is this. Greenleaf did not write our constitution. He did draft a constitution, but it was rejected. The constitutional committee rejected many components. The primary one was the component in which the land and property acquired by the American Colonization Society was supposed to have remained in the possession and the ownership and control of the American Colonization Society. So the plan was, that you can have political power, but you, we're, everything's gonna remain the same. We're still gonna control the land. It's ours, we bought it. it, it wasn't yours. We negotiated with these natives, we signed these treaties. And even the ones that Robert signed, he was doing so on the auspices of ACS. So these men put in that constitution two clauses. The first one is you had to be a person of color, meaning you had to be of African descent. You had to be African in order to be a citizen and you had to be a citizen in order to own land. You had to be a citizen in order to own land. You had to be African in order to be a citizen. And then they asked them at the point of the declaration, what about our land rights? Samuel Benedict, the president of the committee said, that was not our assignment. Meaning we didn't go there to address your land rights. We went there to declare independence. I mean, that was courageous. And I will pause there. Right, so let me end. Uh, and Samuel Benedict, president, J. N. Lewis, Hilary Teague, Beverly Wilson, Elijah Johnson, and J.B. Griffin, Montserrado County, from Grand Baza, John Day, A.W. Gardner, Amos Herring, and Ephraim Hadler. Then from Sino, R.E. Murray, and Jacob W. Proud, who was the secretary of the convention. So you have 12 years and instead of 11, but uh, Jabari will go into that. Well, the secretary wasn't a The secretary was not a Right. He wasn't a delegate. There were 11 signers and one secretary. So I really want to get into a couple of these men, a couple of, the, of these founders, because, again, we tend to look at these people as people on a piece of paper. They're utterly, they're dehumanized. If you were to ask the average person, who was Samuel Benedict? Who was John N. Lewis? Who was Hillary T? or Beverly R. Wilson, Elijah Johnson, most couldn't tell you. And that is disappointing because what makes your document powerful is not just the words that are written. It was 
the people that led it, the people that made it possible. These men were not just these men were not just people there just to sign a paper and say, look, we declare independence. They had a vision. You had people like Samuel Benedict and Hillary T who were born into slavery, were enslaved at one point in their lifetime. They saw the brutality of having their fellow brothers and sisters being whipped, being lashed, being sold away. We're talking about situations where family members in that area, in, the, in Savannah, in the low country of South Carolina, 55% of black children did not make it to 15 because the conditions were so brutal. When Samuel Benedict left, he said, I would never return to the United States for $5,000, which was a lot of money back then. He made it very clear and made up his mind he was going to this country Liberia, this territory for liberty, for equality, for pursuit of happiness. That's why Liberia means liberty. Liberty, pursuit of happiness, freedom. He could finally get this. You had people like John and Lewis, who was very intelligent. He worked in the military. He would go on to be Secretary of State under E.J. Roy. You had people like Anthony W. Gardner, who was also in the military, would go on to become our president. He is the one founder, person who signed this document that became the president. Samuel Benedict ran for president, but he lost to our first president, Joseph Jenkins Roberts. But he went on to serve as our chief justice of the Supreme Court. Elijah Johnson, a war veteran of 1812, was there from the very beginning. This culmination of Liberia's independence would not have happened had Elijah Johnson not been there. Oops. Elijah Johnson kept that vision from the very beginning. When they first arrived to 1847, he was there. John Day, a minister. He had a school. He was a teacher. He taught both African American and indigenous and recaptured Africans. Everybody was taught at that school. He was well educated. He was described as studying the science of jurisprudence and statesmanship. In Edward Wilmot Blyden's book, book, there is a eulogy given to John Day. This brilliant chief justice of the Supreme Court, following in the path of Samuel Benedict as well. Hillary T., who wrote this, was the mentor of Edward Wilmot Blyden. You don't have Edward Wilmot Blyden if you don't have Hillary T. These are some of the background stories of these men. What I want you guys to take from these men, these were just not men who signed a paper. They had a vision. They were educated. They rose, some of them, from being enslaved to being African statesmen, sovereign, free, and able to control their own destiny. These are who these men were. You and I, we are the product. We are the legacy of them. They don't do this. The course of African history is completely changed. Exactly. You don't exactly. have Blyden. You don't have Garvey. You don't have Nkrumah. You don't have Toure. You don't have none of them if this document is not signed. And I'll leave it here. Perfect. The reason why 1847 is so important and I'm going to do it, especially in, in, in the context to the country they were coming from. People were skeptical 
of going there because it was under the rule of the ACS. It was the ACS that a lot of African revolutionaries and leaders were hesitant to go to Liberia. It wasn't until 1847 when Liberia officially became independent that black leaders, especially in the States, considered Liberia and said, this is the place we needed to go because now it was a free and sovereign nation. They were now in control. Bravo, Jabari. Liberia, 1847, not 1822. 1847. Liberia, 1847. This is why it's important before people take on tasks of narrating the nation's story that they take the time to understand it first. And when we were disappointed and vocal about this affront of recognizing ACS as the founders and claiming that 2022 was the somehow the, 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 the culmination of this, this is why. It's not because we were against African repatriation. It was because we needed people to understand the significance of 1847, July 26, 1847. Sierra Leone had repatriation long before Liberia. Yeah. Freetown, I should say. This is what distinguishes us from Freetown. Are you Mayor or Percy? Any addition? I'll, I'll let Percy go first and I'll come after you. I mean, I think something I've been said here. Um, the characteristics of the guys um, on the, the men, on, I won't call them guys, the men on the, on the Declaration of Independence is important. Um, what they did was important, but equally so what they were in the broader Liberian context in terms of, for me, I have been studying them from an economic standpoint, financial economic standpoint. And most of the most of the men on that, declar on that declaration of independence, yeah, they were jurists and they were law, they were pastors, but they were also businessmen. And we we have you you we forget that uh, I think teach alluded to some of the, the tensions that, that that actually drove them also to declare independence. A lot of that came from economic tensions also. You know, the rivalry between um, the European merchants and the Liberians who had lived on the coast and had cornered the coastal trade in, in a way that made it difficult, right? When the Europeans came to go through them. So um, a lot of them were, were a lot of them were also rich in the Liberian country. They were also wealthy men, right? Guys like David Lewisin, Samuel Benende was one of the first farmers to own a, a coffee farm there. You can see that in the 1843 census that was conducted. He's he's a, he's a farmer. He has a large plantation, and you know, so these were not just um, people like 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 Cole and others were saying that just went there and signed some document. These were independent men. I mean, and independent in the sense that they were economically independent also. It's not just independent because they went and uh, they were also economically independent. These people had um, money. I, I mean, if you, if you subscribe it to that time, they, they were fairly well off in, in the Liberian context. So these were not poor guys coming together and saying, yeah, you know, they had, they had lived there. They had, they had, they had carved out a life for themselves. And so those economic tensions also play a very important part a very important role in, in, in forging a nation towards independence, and that should be noted also. No, that, that's, that's very important. So these guys came together, it was not like that was time to eat too. No, no, no. Oh, no. That is very important. <laughs> well, yeah, that's a very good point you made there. We have to understand that um, that, that Liberia was, it was it, it was built, it was birthed out of, it was birthed out of distress, out of oppression, out of 
us wanting to excel in life, out of us wanting to get to somewhere, that's the, the, the hope that our forefathers had forming this nation. It was not, oh, we came from America, we just want to have a place to be. No, that wasn't it. That was us getting out of this shadow that had been hanging over our head like we were some animals, or maybe 75% animals. So we have to first and foremost see like as what she represents, why she became. And that is important because if we keep looking at ourselves from different corners and different places, we wouldn't see her as the whole that she is. And if we don't if we don't we don't see the significance of her being birthed, we will not follow the plans and the hope that our forefathers set in place. We have now deviated from those places. So we have to understand why. Libra is an asylum. That word, we, we go at places today seeking asylum. That word, we are asylum with the home for the black man. We, when I say this, I get emotional. We, we are home. We need to get somewhere. We need to stop looking at ourselves as just tribes. As just, oh, those people came. I hate those kind of English. The, the men that sat to sign that paper, they were the sons of Africa. I, 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 got, I, I got children that I had abroad. When they come home, they're still Africans. Let's look at that. When they come home, they're still Africans. And... When our people first gave them a, a, a Providence Island, they knew that were their cousins. You have to understand that part. They knew that were their cousins. They knew that they sent them uh, uh, on slave ships. And they had nowhere to go but come home. When I go to Liberia, I go home. And those are the part of our independence I want us to understand. I don't want us to look at Liberia today. I want us to look at like bro, from where she came from, why she came from there. And it just put shows on my in my spine when I read these words of Hillary teach. It's just like wow. It's just wow. You know, we we are the people that our forefathers trusted to do the right thing. That's all I wanted to say. And and Dennis and Dennis and and also the version of this story that is being told, it's not it, it won't sink. People people were, were real against it because it talks about cooperation. They don't talk about the cooperation. They, they they always talk about the division between the the the, the people the people who founded Liberia and the indigenous people they met there. Right? I I told somebody. The people who founded Liberia, the, the American Liberians, would not have existed in Liberia with all the acquiescence of the indigenous people. Exactly. Because, because I mean, the guy come. Imagine me go to your village and, and Dennis. I don't know the herbs in 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 the, in the village they play coming from, and why not? I get sick there, and you know your territory. You know your terrain. You say, okay, my 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 person, I will fix you. Some kind of herb here, you know, it will kill you. That's what we're going on between people amongst people right i have letters here from liberians who who were who were who were dying and they got killed by they call them medicine men we still call them medicine men but they they give them nostrils that they, they give them herbal medicine to kill them so imagine imagine had you just left them there for dead right if these people the indigenous people are not if now are not welcoming as as, as we, we we make it to seem they were in right if they did not cooperate with these people, there would not have been Liberia. There was explicit acquiescence from the indigenous people towards these people. There were cooperations on so many fronts. Okay, yeah. that gave us what we have today. But that version is not compatible with a, a, a certain segment of our society, and so people don't like to highlight that. Liberia is the work of cooperation, basically. I think I think part of the problem too is the oversimplification of African people. We're talking about when, when let's say uh, um, a dam man, a dam man from, from Northern Liberia, as we say, Gio, a dam man from Northern Liberia, they will say something, they're talking about something and they will say, oh, our, we native people, we indigenous people, 
What does that mean? Who? We were not some monolithic group, you know, homogeneous group of people, or as they say, homogeneous group of people, right? We we're not just some monolithic people running around beating drums, all doing the same thing. I earlier described the Gola Day War, where it was very unequal. Katamba was planning to wipe them all out. You had before that, that had almost devastated the day population, a basically a raid from the Northern Manding people who came in and conquered all those places. It would have now Boparu and in, in, in those areas. Things had been happening. There was not one group of people. There was not one nation. They were surrounded by multiple nations, warring uh, uh, rival uh, ethnicities, different languages, different religious beliefs and loyalties, different levels of technological advancement and exposure to warfare and artillery and, and military power. It was not some simplistic thing. And this is the problem of interpretation. If you think, if you buy into the missionary narrative, the white supremacist narrative that was painted by Southern missionaries, mostly Southern missionaries from the United States, whites, coming from places that owned slaves, who had been told all their lives that Africans were, were savage, and because they're Christian, the Liberians are trusting their Christian brethren to come and set up a curriculum. What do they do? They come and they tell Africans, including Basa children and Grebo children and Crow children, they're telling them, you were completely savage. Your ancestors were savage. You knew nothing until we came. That foolish narrative prevails to this day. Liberians actually believe that. Yeah. So even as Percy talks about this economic cooperation, you had these long distance traders mm -hmm. that were coming in from far and wide, from places as far away as Mali, Senegal, bringing goods. They were aware of this even before independence. This is why ACS was there. ACS also, and Percy, you can elaborate on this because it's your area, but ACS was an economic venture. You think those people yeah. were there? for feel good reasons they were there to make money. Uh-huh. But that was the initial plan for ACS, right? They wanted to establish their own trading colony and whatnot for goods to be coming here and other ones going the opposite direction. So it was, it was for it, investing. It was, they had investors yeah. in this whole scheme. It was something almost similar to what happened in America, right? Uh, in the various states then that you see on the on the in eastern seaboard. It started off as uh, companies, uh, British so and so company, that other so and so company. That's the same thing they had in Sierra Leone, the Sierra Leone, British, whatever company. So yeah. these were not initially state entities as they started. They did not start as state owned entities. They started all as business ventures, right? So exactly. You have to disabuse yourself of that. And, and, and that's why they get confused and all oh, it was colonized by the United States. No, the U.S. First of all, you also have to reiterate that the partitioning of Africa had not yet happened. No. And though the, the transatlantic slave trade was abolished in 1808, 1809 on paper, it was not ended. Yeah. Liberia was not colonized because the United States government did not have control over the territory. It was not an official part of the United States like Sierra Leone was Britain, which was the, it was legally part of Britain. It was in the United States. It was unconstitutional for them to even consider that. The US government had no influence over Liberia. And the ACS was a private organization, like you said, a business. This was not a state entity connected to the government that was officially part of the government. Yeah, that, that's, that's very important. ACS. And, and the people 
the, the repatriates who were coming there. Many of them, our families, especially in Georgia, South Carolina, came from the Windward Coast, came from Liberia, came from Sierra Leone during the transatlantic slave trade. They so have yeah. blood ties. So just to add to what Jabari is what, what Jabari is saying is that uh, he said a lot, but one thing I want to emphasize and clarify. The Windward Coast, the Pepper Coast, the Grain Coast, and I have disputed this. Grain doesn't mean grains of paradise and pepper. Grain means rice. That again is just, you know, trying to belittle the, the because grain, uh, the pepper that was uh, being sold was wild pepper. But mm -hmm. when you call it the rice coast, the grain coast, and you realize it was agriculture going on. They were not calling it grains of paradise. It was the grain coast because of rice. And if you look at how much rice was being traded from our shores, that was what motivated plantation owners in South Carolina and Georgia seacoast here, where near where we, Jabari and I live. Jabari himself is a Gullah Geechee, descendant of, 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 of Liberia, Sierra Leone. So they went there specifically to purchase rice farms. Many of those who returned, including the Tudmans, coming from the same Gullah Geechee heritage, were taken because of their agricultural skills. We brought rice farming so, to America. Say it. Yeah. So many of these people, of course, they were West African. Of course, they were mixed up with other West Africans because they, you know, were meeting other West Africans in the New World. But many of these people had actual biological ties. There are so many stories of people who are only one or two generations removed from Africa saying, oh, I was Gola. I was this, I was that. Oh, my mother spoke this language. Those things are captured and documented. Yeah. So we have to be very careful about trying to compare Liberia to South Africa where you have people going somewhere to take over land. Uh, Dennis, I want you to go back to that um, where he says that they, they were not they were not there for um, oh gosh, what is the word? They were not there for land aggrandizement or ambition. Yes. Yeah. Re read that line again, Jabari. That's very important because this, this of all, I mean, this is so much if people just took the time to read for themselves or if the government would be responsible enough Previous. to create its own curriculum for its own children and stop allowing people who do not like black people to create curriculums for Liberia. Mm. Can you go to the previous slide, I think, the previous slide? Oh, wait, you're right, you're right, that's right, I see now. It says right here, okay. Liberia is not the offspring of grasping ambition, nor the tool of avarish, avaricious speculation. No desire for territorial aggrandizement brought us to these shores. No desire for territorial aggrandizement brought us to these shores. We did not come here to grab land. We did not come here to conquer. This is not a conquest. We came home. Came home. There is nowhere that you will hear Austra uh, 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 white Australians or South Africans or Americans talking this way. No. They thought it was their destiny. They thought it their was their destiny to commit mass genocide and take over people's land. Mm -hmm. And the reason Liberians think that this is their history, South African history is their history, is because we learn about South Africa in school. We don't learn about Liberia in school. Mm -hmm. We learn about apartheid in school. So our frame, of, and it's not an accident. This is intentional. Our frame of reference is apartheid South Africa. So much so that we practice such cognitive dissonance in Liberia in the 1970s and, 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 and 80s. Think about this. We own as what we consider to be indigenous ethnic groups 
all throughout the counties, over 80% of the land. And I know this because I work for Land Commission and we surveyed all the land in the country. Yet we say who owns the land. Um. We're sitting on top of our land and we're asking who owns the land because we are thinking that we're in the situation that South Africans are in. And we're saying things like, Aman la awetu. <laughs> you understand? Because we're being educated with South African history and we think it is analogous to us. It's pathetic. And the, and the thing, the this is a country, just one last thing, this is a country that during apartheid, South Africans used to come to for refuge and Definitely. citizenship. Yeah. One of yeah. the reasons for the 1976 citizenship and nationalization laws was USAID, the Americans and the Europeans and the South African white apartheid South African government wanted to make sure that Liberia no longer was an asylum or a bastion of citizenship for oppressed black people. So they sponsored the writing of that very ridiculous law, which was unconstitutional, which contradicted the constitution of Liberia. And because we were so, oh, you know that America, they are friends, the international community, they did that to circumvent what Talbert was doing, which was come here. If they will not allow you, come and be Liberian. They won't give you a passport. Here's a Liberian passport. This is an asylum. Come home. This is an asylum. And all African freedom fighters up until the 1970s saw Liberia as an asylum from oppression, from European tyranny. And some of our thinkers, some of our scholars, some of our lawyers thought it was smart because of the xenophobia and manipulation from the US State Department to reverse and write laws that, contra that are contradictory to the Constitution. Where the Constitution says, this is a home, an asylum, that you only had to be a Negro to be a Liberian. That was saying, even if you're born in Liberia and you're black and your father's from South Africa, you're not, South you're not Liberian. You can't have citizenship. if they're from Rhodesia and they come running away from some of the most grinding oppression on the continent of Africa. They cannot have citizenship in Liberia. Think about that. That only happens when you don't educate your children about their constitution and about their declaration of independence and of the purpose of their nation. Mm -hmm. I, want to, I want to add yeah. on to that. That Liberian declaration of independence was not only talking about the present time that they were in. It talked about, the, it really also talks about the future. Yeah, Everything point. that you read about the life in the Liberian Declaration of Independence, the situation that led them to Liberia is exactly being, in, can be shown here in, in the United States. Yeah. They prefer immigrants. They wow. said they prefer people of another color from other countries over us. We see that today in the United States. Liberia right. is still necessary. It is they still said necessary. That they were denied voting. We see in the United States right now voter suppression laws, voting rights acts being gutted. We see everything that the Liberian Declaration of Independence address right now. They were telling us, this is why you need this. This is why we had to come here. Because if we didn't come here, you will always be facing that. They Thank talk you. about educating the children in the Declaration of Independence. How many times have we seen today our children being miseducated? You have a situation right now where in one instance, in the context of the state of Florida, you have them teaching <laughs> that slavery was a benefit to black people. It is required that black students, students in the state of Florida have to learn that slavery was a benefit to black people, that we learned skills 
from slavery. This is what they're doing. They, yeah. I mean, so, so not, not to cut you off, Jabari, but I want to make sure that we keep this um, really focused on Liberia. Mm -hmm. The idea of this Declaration of Independence gives each citizen of Liberia a profound purpose and a burden of responsibility that they have to carry. The reason they don't teach this is because they do not want Liberian children to walk around with the kind of confidence that is required to carry the torch of their country. If Liberian children knew this in 1960, where would Liberia be today? If Liberian children were taught this in 1970, where would Liberia be today? What extreme, excellent, overachieving Percy's and Jabari's would we have produced if our curriculums were taught correctly or, 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 or created correctly and provided truthful information, factual information about why the country was established. Liberia is a work in process. It's a project. But we drop the ball. Mm -hmm. We drop the ball and we have become the torchbearers of the hate narrative, the false narrative that they use to destroy the country. We have become the proud torchbearers of the propaganda that they use to destroy the country. And now we spread this propaganda effortlessly without any facts, without any sources, without any evidence. In the face of tremendous evidence to the contrary, we sing the hate narrative that destroyed our country. Why? Because we do not want to eat. We do not want to challenge. We do not want to stand up and do the work that is necessary to manifest the destiny that was laid out in 1847. Mm -hmm. yeah. They don't want us to have the courage to do so. The but truth God is going to give you courage. The God truth is going to give you courage. A God boy in Nima County can tell you if people were excluded from that bureau from the beginning. You are not even near that bureau. How can you Percy, do you mind if I tell you the story about why why Nimba and Lofa and part of Bone County, especially Nimba and Lofa, sorry, um, protrude into Guinea? Do you know that story? That story why it's not part of Guinea? Mm -mm. Does anyone on the panel know why Lofa and Nimba are not part of Guinea? Because people there fought for we, we, it. Yeah, we know that. They said they were going to. So be there was a point in time when Liberia territory basically, theoretically, because of negotiations with, with the kings of the rulers of Musar, there was a negotiation, and everyone was under the understanding that the territory went to the headwaters of all these rivers at this point. And the this headwaters? The, the headwaters, where the rivers. Okay, uh, okay, okay. The, the, the source waters, the source yeah. waters of the rivers. So that would be basically Zerikur. And then you have the whole Samori Ture uh, resistance, right? And so when Samori was conquered in Liberian territory with literally thousands of his warriors were being targeted, many of them retreated into the Liberian territory for refuge. Okay. And as the French fought to encroach upon Liberian territory, which they did, and acquired much of it by force and un un uh, unlawfully, mm -hmm. it was those barefoot militia, those barefoot militia that fought to defend themselves from being colonized. And what prevented their conquest, what prevented the French flag from being planted there was them planting the Liberian flag and refusing to allow them to pass. Specifically, 
at the St. John River in the in the in the old ancient trade city of Gompa, what we call Ganta today. Mm -hmm. They pushed all the way to that river and they planted the Liberian flag on the river and they said, You will not pass. Some of these borders that we take for granted are painted or drawn with the blood of barefoot militia. Lama boys, Mano boys, Maninka boys, the Matingo boys, Bandi boys, the Kisi boys that lost their lives, we don't know their names, but those are the heroes that make it possible that for some of Mount Nimba to have remained in Liberia. Mm -hmm. Those are the heroes that made it possible for the Wologisi range to remain in Liberia. We should not pretend that we had an option of remaining outside of modern statehood. It was either we maintain ourselves with Liberia or we become subjugated by the French or, yeah. the, British. or the British. Those were the options. In, in, in Those were the options. And the choice, unlike the rest of Africa, because of Liberia, we had a choice. That's why I said that document, though it occurred 40 years earlier, 50 years earlier, that document made it possible for me to be Liberian. And they do not teach that in school. And for somebody to be Dan or Gyo or whatever you want to call it and say, we were not included, it's only because the curriculum that he's taught is just ridiculous. It doesn't even address it. How can you not tell the children of Nimba and Lofa this triumphant story? Mm -hmm. If not for them, Liberia would be a sliver of land on the coast. Yep. Exactly. Mm -hmm. All right. This, th th thank you. So from, let me put on a few comments here because here, here is it. So we read it comes to the Declaration of Independence, beautiful, but here is what and this has been said by people also in Liberia that, hey, this is a beautiful document, but they never live by it. Sam Wallow said maybe it's because what was written and what happened in practice were two very different things. Indigenous people were excluded as evidenced by today's oratory. Talking about Zanzan Kawaski, the political speech. Come on now. Joe, Joe Wilson said, but they became the opposite of everything expressed. A fitting wow. description of Malcolm's field Negro versus house Negro. The, the, the proud torchbearers of the lies that destroyed the country. They're coming in forth and that is you're reading the words. Right. They think and the people country. sound very smart when they say these things without, I mean, was there classism? Yes. There was classism. The, the thing is, mm -hmm. the thing is some people try, you know, sorry. So then talk about what happened and why the divide and bad treatment of the indigenous people occur. This is Sam Wallow also. I, I um, think so. This, this is an example. Let me, let me, let me say something. I, mean, I, I, I am a, a Ma woman. I'm a Mano woman. And let, let, let Percy go, Jabari, and then you come. Yeah, that yeah, now go to yeah. I think, I think I think what is not appreciated here by most of the guys that write these things about the division and whatnot. I, I, I think that the, the mistake Liberia was a very weak, very weak state or whatever in terms of the economic largest that you needed to support. The kind of structure that they created there, right? So when you say when you say why, why did they didn't do this and why did they didn't do that, <laughs> I have been I have been flying through the, the the fiscal records of this country, right? It was good at one point, and then it started to go down another point after we did our Maryland annexation, and then all hell broke loose. You already don't have money, then you say you're going to adopt somebody. That what happened, and then everything started to go downhill from there. 
and then you had the raw tobacco and everything else that happened after war. And then we had the first installment of domestic mo- domestic revenue mobilization that happened on the crew coast that caused all the wars and whatnot and stuff like that. So people have to follow these threads, right? If you don't read these things with a clear mind, a clear eye, and understand the fiscal history of this country and how these guys managed to even even manage to keep what we call a country today. Tell me about it. It's, it's, it's almost like a miracle because think yeah. about it is a miracle. Think about be, being between like Liberia's a buffer. If you really look at Liberia's a buffer between France and Great Britain, right? That's what Liberia is, right? And to survive between these two great powers at the time, it took skills, it took um certain amount of cunning and maneuverability, diplomat diplomatic. You had to be a very skilled diplomat to be to be to be able to to maneuver your way between these two great powers. They has they have big guns. They had strong armies. Liberia had none of those things. And yet, instead, no. we are still here. You yeah. know what I mean? Like Cole said, right? Mm-hmm. Thanks to, we only talk about the American Liberians, have, but now I've learned tonight that people pull a Liberian flag in, 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 in Nimba and Lofa and whatnot. But yet, instead, we don't talk about these conciliatory no. points in our history. We talk about the one that, 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 that people are saying they didn't live by this, they didn't live by that, right? That's why we have laws, right? If, if if human beings were flawless, you would not have laws. Yeah. So that's why you have laws, right? People do things that they call rule of law. And you you face the consequences, at least for the time being, they they I mean, I mean they were not perfect. You can look, you can pinpoint anywhere, any one of them and say, Yeah, this person was this and this person was that. But as a group, what they managed to accomplish, I mean it's it's in this day and age, looking back and all the obstacles that it had to, I don't think some of us were even muster the courage to go even further. Yeah, exactly. All right. Jabari, and then we, we are we are approaching two hours mark, so Yes. Uh-huh. I just want to say this or that situation is a prime example of being so invested in a narrative, in that miseducation, that you cannot possibly fathom that there was any other possible scenario or storyline. It seems there is such an investment in that narrative as if it's an identity as if your livelihood depends on that. <laughs> on this, on this <laughs> line. <laughs> on the false narrative, yeah. Uh, we have done, we have done, on, on Focus on Liberia, show after show highlighting indigenous people and their contribution to Liberia and why Liberia still exists today. We have done this numerous times and we have emphasized it was liberia perfect no no country is perfect but the way we treat our own country the way we treat liberia we don't treat any other country countries can have their own abuse and mistreatment and yet we'll still prop them up yeah, I, I just wanted to say very quickly, Dennis, because we're not really addressing the concern of these people. And that's why I wanted to answer right after the questions were asked. As a Native woman, as a Ma woman, um, is there an idea, a, a prevailing idea that Indigenous people are inferior? The answer is yes. What you are angry about is not Liberia. It's about the doctrine of white supremacy that makes Africanness something savage and primitive. This is a global narrative. You're gonna to go to China and you're gonna be black and they're gonna treat you like crap. You're gonna to go to Europe as a black person, you're gonna be treated like crap. You're gonna to go to Puerto Rico where they have you know, black people there, they're still gonna treat you like crap. It is because the entire world, including Africans, have adopted this concept that the whiter you are, the better you are. So when you are in Liberia and someone is culturally westernized, 
They go to church. They know how to eat with a knife and fork. They speak English well. They dress like Westerners. And you put against that person, and this is just raw truth, a ma woman like myself who may be, you know, wearing a lapa and maybe my, 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 my chest is exposed. They're going to look down upon that person as a savage. That is a fact. That is not something that African-Americans introduced to the world. This is something that Western imperialism introduced to the world. And it is this concept that European culture was superior mm -hmm existed before 1822 on the Green Coast. I have evidence of that. And it's because they had been trading with us, interacting with us, enslaving us, having mulatto children with us for generations, for centuries. This is embedded even in us as indigenous people. It was not introduced by the Republic of Liberia. They did not invent white supremacy and they did not introduce it to the Grain Coast. So all of this, oh, why did they treat us so bad? Why is it that your own villagers, when they become educated and westernized, call you witches and refuse to go see you? Okay. It's the same thing. We have to stop this complaining. You've got genocide that happened in Biafra in Nigeria. You don't hear Nigerians with this hate narrative that you hear coming from Liberia. You have to ask yourself, what really happened? Nobody took our land. Nobody stopped us from going to school. You think all those schools in Nimba, in Grand Gita, all these places would exist? Oh, if not for the Republic of Liberia? And because they didn't have the financial resources, they partnered with churches uh -huh. and asked them to come and bring education. What would you have wanted to happen? Tell me about it. Even we, as we come westernized and Christianized, we start to, oh, hmm. oh, put on shed. Oh, what are you doing this? It is a cultural shift. And all of these people that are writing these things about discrimination, how did they learn to read and write? Tell me about it. Everybody in Liberia went to the same schools. There was no segregation in education. There was no segregation in churches. If you were a Christian and you went to church, you went to church with everybody else. If you went to school, you went to school with everybody else. The president's son and Yapa Wolo's son sat in the same class. You know this. You experienced it. Why don't you think about that before you start talking about segreg uh, uh, apartheid? Look at CWA, look at Morovia College, look at Cottington, look at University of Light Brook, look at Tudman, look at Gantha Methodist, St. Mary's, Lutheran. That's what I wanted to say. It's, it's cognitive dissonance. Thank, thank, thank you. We will, we will be winding down shortly. And again, happy, happy July 26th. Let me remind you of what's coming up. Tomorrow on Tough Talking Thursday, we're going to have the State of the Nation at 176. You will have our regular panelists and will be joined by Honorable William Greaves, that's the former Consul General, Republic of Liberia, New York, with our Governor's Consultant, Amr Salif, our Policy Analyst, Carl Fangle, Dr. Dukle, and our Political Analyst, Mohammed Sharif. Also on Friday, we continue on the independence story, One Mile to Independence, the, on the Literary Hour with Dr. K. Moses Nawe and the scholar Jackie Sire. You don't want to miss that. Then on Saturday, I will be here with Madam Sarah Beslo Yanti, as a standard bearer of the African Liberation League. She is a president <laughs> of Aaron, and so I'm going to be hosting her so we can talk about her aspiration and her campaign to become president of the country. You don't want to miss it. And then oh, wow. on Sunday, we have our Independence Day celebration under the theme, Sovereignty, Independence, and Responsible Citizenship. You also don't want to miss it. Our keynote, the national orator for this year, is Carl Family. Please join us at Sunday at 4 p.m. Well, uh, 
if you're watching us and you feel like my your red, white, and blue deserve 26, please <laughs> don't hesitate to give me my 26. Well, uh, Carl and the rest, and uh, are you made Jabari and Percy? Thank you very much. I want us to close now uh, on the Declaration of Independence and uh, what the day means to us and how we are, I like how we have situated the, the context. So I'm not, I started being angry about the Declaration of Independence the more I started to read it myself and understand it. But before that, I was foaming, especially when they say, we have come to this barbarous coast. I said, who are these people talking to us like this? So Where does it say that? <laughs> Let, huh? Where does it say that? Yeah, it, it's it's there. Yeah. Oh, the barbarous post. I, I I posted I posted the uh, the link there for the Declaration of Independence. If you have time for uh, for audio, the people said they want to buy your book. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. No, the book has more. The book has more than that. Uh, yeah, post a link for your book. Your Amazon link. People said they want to buy your book. That, uh, Amazon, that's uh, the Republic of Liberia, foundational words of our nation. So you, you you want to get a copy. I have my copy here that I refer to. And the good thing about it, the Constitution, it has some questions in there. And those questions will, I mean, be very, very much uh, intriguing. You, you, you will like the question and answer and see how this was the first time during this book. That's the first time I read the, the entire Constitution. Couple wow. of the Before, first one or the, uh, or the 1986 one? 86. Okay. And, and the, in the in the sequel, we're going to include the, uh, the 1847 Constitution as well. But this was, you know, the Constitution, most of the time, the way I was reading it was uh, when you're looking for an article, then you go there. But it's a different thing if you read it from cover to cover. You yeah, understand yeah. better. Sure. You yeah. understand how those and every are. citizen should be taught that. Yeah. Unfortunately, we, we don't we don't do that. Even there's an article there that says, the constitution should be taught, it should be disseminated. Yeah. And we just go. So uh, enough of my you know ranting. No, but you're right, that it should be taught and disseminated. And it, it, it's not being done because they don't want you to know how to vote and why you vote. And they don't want you to know that the representatives illegal threshold bill has people sitting there as an extent to the constitution. Because if you read it, you would be outraged at what's happening in government. They don't want to understand your responsibilities. Yes, Disproportionate representation is unconstitutional. You won't know that if you don't read the Constitution. No. Yeah. So let's go around the room. Let me get your closing for the day. Percy, let's let's go. Well, um, happy Independence Day to um guys. I I think it passed Independence in Liberia now. But happy Independence Day. Um, what I want to leave with is that um, what I always tell people, Liberia is more than a nation state. Liberia stands as a testament to the backward notion of um, white supremacy, um, to the anti-intellectual notion that black people are, are inferior. That, that, that train of thought have no basis in anthropological um, um, in anthropological realms, um, like bursting as a testament to what's possible for for us as Black people. Um, she might be facing some challenging times now, but um, this is a project, right? What a project is, is you're always doing something on a project. There's always something there to fix. It's never perfect, right? So there's always something there to fix. So libraries are projects, an ongoing project. When they sign the document, that document, independence was not a destination, right? It was just a it was it was a way forward, right? And so we have to all take up this mantle and try to see the country for for what it is, right? And try to make it better. Even if you think it's it, it was flawed from the beginning, right? You 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 should strive in your own weak ways to try to make it better and not try to um, make it worse. Um, but thank you, Dennis, for the time. Thank you, Cole. Thank you, Jabari. And um, Madam Cassette, thank you very much. Um, it was nice being here. Um, unfortunately, I have to drop off because, you know, I, but I enjoy the show. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Uh, Madam Cassette, 
Somebody says you should finish your statement. I don't know which statement you were making, but give, you're, you're closing. No, that's all right. I will just give my closing statement. Um, Like, example, the five of us that was just here just now is what I call Liberia. We are from diverse, different backgrounds. And this is what Liberia is. And that's what we should respect. We are not all from the same place, but we have come together on the one umbrella for the sake of freedom, for the sake of black excellence, for the sake of our generation to come. So I want us to understand when we look at Liberia, we look at us from different uncles and different walks of life that have come together to be Liberia. And we are the example of black excellence. And we should take more time in our civic duties in what is our responsibility? Be informed about your country so you cannot be fooled. So you cannot be manipulated. So that you can do the right thing by your country, by your land, for the next generation. It is your responsibility. So let's stop all this narrative. Who's from where? Who's not from where? We're Liberians. Let's stop grabbing onto different corners of Liberia. I am Liberia. You are Liberia. And nobody's going to fix it for us but we ourselves. Let's stop looking to people that never, ever wanted you to exist in the first place. How can someone be your enemy yesterday and love you today? Wake up. We are Liberians. Let's build Liberia. Happy Independence Day. And it's a miracle that we're here after 175 years. 76 years to be alive. Thank you. Happy Independence Day, Madam Cassell. Basel Barry. So Jibari is, is a Basel man, so we call him Basel Barry. <laughs> I wanted to, I really thought he was cruel, but. No, no, that Basel Barry. Cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I want to say Liberian Independence Day means everything. It is a special day. It's a day that will always go down in world history. It's a reminder of just how great of a country this is, how powerful its background is. And I just want to make this statement. Liberian Independence Day is every day. I know we celebrate July 26th as a formal celebration, but it's every day. It's July 27th. It's December 30th. It's April 5th. Liberian Independence Day, that vision, those values are carried every day with us. And we need to be remember that wherever we are, whether or not it be in Grand Basa, or be in Nimba, or be in Grand Gita, or River Sets, or Lofa, that spirit is carried, needs to be carried with us every day. And, and, and you know, most people tell you if it's called Librarian, you don't put it old, and you, so somebody is calling you Basa Barrio. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, that, that's, that's it. So if you, if you call, <laughs> Yeah, a white guy was teaching and say, if you want to speak like Brent English, just put it O at the end, you'll get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's start saying a man love way too. Mm. That's, that's, a, that's ridiculousness. Yeah, I don't know even if they understand oh. what they're saying, but. That's oh, by the way, one of your viewers of uh, It's so embarrassing. I know, in, right? So. Oh, oh, yeah. Uh, uh, Priscilla posted your article. So if you want to read that article, that uh, it's so beautiful. Yeah, Thank you. Thank you. So you can I've see been that posting article. excerpts of it too on, on, on Facebook with videos and uh, it's powerful. Okay. Call you got the last word. Yeah, so I I think we have said all, but the the, the, the one thing I want to say is that the reason we observe July 26th, like Rose Independence Day, is to remind the citizens of their responsibility to carry the torch forward. It's not to promote George Weah or Alex Cummings or Joseph Boykai or any other politician. It's to talk about, it's not to talk about who didn't do what to our country and how dead the streets are, it is for us to understand our responsibility to the state. And I was, once again, as I am every year, very disappointed in the people who stand up and say they're ready to lead Liberia, vote for me. Oh, we're losing you. I was saying, can you hear me? Oh, I think Can you hear me? Oh, I'm hearing you. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Carl. It's my, my system. 
I was just expressing my disappointment in the people who stood up and raised their hand and said they want to leave the country and the person who's still leaving the country and the, 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 the sideshow of, a, of, a, of an observation that they had today. Um, not talking to the citizens, not acknowledging why the country's independent, not mentioning a single name of a sign of a declaration, not mandating to stu schools that they teach this to their students, all about himself. Even the orator spent most of the time distorting history and promoting the president. I didn't even listen to that. If George Weah had been taught proper civics in school, if all of those adults sitting there had been taught the truth about their country, we wouldn't be here. We can fix this. We can reverse what they did to us. This was an act of war. Whenever you wanna destabilize people, you wanna abuse people, you separate them from their history. You bury their history, you distort it. Liberia is still here. As long as we still have our sovereignty, our physical sovereignty, the heavy lifting has been done. All that's left for us to do is change our mindset. Yeah. That's all that's left. Happy Independence Day, everybody. And it was a pleasure to discuss the Liberia Declaration of Independence today. Thank you. On that note, we close with our song that says, we are all Liberians. What are you? We are all Liberians. You are Congo. <laughs> you are Congo, Gribble, or Gil. What are you? Are ANC? That. ABC, <laughs> that's or, all. Whatever political party, we are all Liberians, and that's what matters. Let's do our very best to make our country the glorious <laughs> land of liberty. Have a good night. And good night, Dennis. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Thank you everybody, for coming. We are all Liberians. <laughs>